Check out today's piece of fan art. It's Akame from Akame Ga Kill. I've always enjoyed the color scheme Akame goes with. Red and black work great together, and it's cute seeing Akame in a happy context given all the trauma she's been through. Thank you so much, Otaku King 69. Welcome back to Otaku Daikun, Dai here. Today I come bearing some seething drama surrounding the recent release of River City Girls Zero, a glorified port of a game from the 90s. This game, published by Way Forward, the creators of Shantae, features two different translation options, originally labeled as either the literal translation or the new translation. What seems fairly reasonable to me has clearly offended certain people in the industry who pride themselves on localization and feel this choice paints their work in a bad light. Given my history of scrutinizing localization as an advocate for more literal translation, I feel this is a perfect topic for us to return to. That said, we should always strive to be the better party in all this by properly understanding the context first, as River City Girl Zero has an interesting history. See, what we know is River City is actually the localized version of the Kunio-kun series of games that started way back in 1986. The West first got a taste of this franchise with the NES title River City Ransom, a classic hard-as-nails beat-em-up about a guy trying to rescue his girlfriend from thugs. The entire series is themed around Japan's school gang culture, and while we've gotten a handful of Kunio-kun games released in English as part of the River City franchise, there are plenty of entries that never made it overseas. The rights to the Kunio-kun games are actually owned by Arc System Works, which has a partnership with the Western company Way Forward. As such, the series had a major change when Way Forward was given permission to make their very own River City game. The result was River City Girls, an original beat-em-up starring two girls who fight their way through River City to rescue their boyfriends Kunio and Riki, who used to be the main characters. It's an interesting blend of Japanese and Western sensibilities, oozing with aesthetics reminiscent of Scott Pilgrim and Kill a Kill. Needless to say, I love this silly-ass game, and it's one of those rare examples where I feel a Western-made product can fit nicely within the anime fandom. The direction Way Forward took with this game deviates quite a bit from the series' predecessors, opening it up to a whole new generation of fans. An inside joke within River City Girls is that the two protagonists, Kyoko and Misako, were only ever dating Kunio and Riki for a single game in the franchise, one that never got an official English release. Because of this, Way Forward decided to actually port the old game to modern consoles. In Japan, it's known as Shin Neketsu Koha, Kunio Tachi no Banka. Assuming modern fans would be more interested in the game for Kyoko and Misako, Way Forward decided to call their port River City Girls Zero. In that regard, one could say they're basically taking an older title and rebranding it to fit the new River City Girls theme. Normally, this might seem kinda sleazy, but Way Forward's been very upfront and humorously self aware about what they're doing. There's tons of charm to be found, but it's this very same honesty that has sparked outrage. I said before that this game has two different translations, labeled as literal and new. This actually makes tons of sense given the context. The new translation isn't really a translation at all, but rather a rewriting of the script to incorporate the silly humor River City Girls is known for. The original game, released in the 90s, had a totally different script, which was often more profane and less family-friendly. Regardless, WayForward has included the literal translation to be more faithful to that original. I think the fact they offered this as a choice for players is really awesome, and I wish more companies would take this same approach. Sadly, it seems some vocal localizers on social media took issue with this option, interpreting it as a threat to their own work, and how localization is often criticized as bad or disingenuous. There are various takes, but one that sums it up pretty well is this. So basically, they're catering to the localization is bad crowd without knowing how much damage that could potentially do. Guess what, weebs? Even the literal translation is going to have a localization in it. First off, WayForward has since come out and clarified what they meant by literal translation. It was never meant to be a jab at localizers in their work, but rather a way to distinguish the obvious fact that their own River City Girls style of humor isn't accurate to the original. 
They're very aware that both scripts provide different experiences and are just being honest and giving us both to choose from. Second, this localization is bad mentality is rightfully earned, though it does need some clarity. People get really semantic about what localization actually means, and business professionals often fail to recognize what fans mean when they bring it up. The way we often see it, translation is overcoming the language barrier. We want to know what the Japanese script says so that we can have the same experience Japan got. We often consider localization to be going a step further, taking a translation and adapting it to try to appeal to a perceived demographic. That's where all of 4Kids' censorship comes in. They wanted Pokemon to appeal to Western children, so they dumbed down moments of sex and violence, while changing names and elements of the plot to be more recognizable to English speakers. Kasumi got changed to Misty, Satoshi got changed to Ash, and Onigiri were changed into Jelly Donuts. While this was a huge issue for anime in the 90s and 2000s, more subtle examples of this kind of localization still rear their ugly head in the form of censorship or deliberate changes to a script. In contrast, what is a literal translation? This also gets pretty semantic. When localizers bring up the term, they usually do it mockingly to describe how, say, a machine translation comes out all stiff and awkward, even if it's technically accurate. In Japanese, the way things are written seems natural and elegant to Japanese speakers, but literal translations often don't sound natural to English speakers. Thus, localizers consider rewriting that text to flow more smoothly in English as part of their work. That's what they mean when they say even a literal translation is localized. Yet, this is very disingenuous, as no anime fan has ever taken objection to slightly rewording a sentence to flow better. We still consider that process part of a literal translation. From a fan perspective, translation shifts into localization the moment a writer changes not how something is said, but fundamentally what is being said in the first place. Sadly, this happens all the time, and my channel has documented many cases, ranging from the dreaded patriarchy bit in Dragon Maid to the injection of gender politics into anime that never dealt with that. More shameless examples can be found in Nintendo localizations of Fire Emblem games, where entire conversations barely resemble each other at all between languages, and fans do a much better job translating it on their own. Strangely enough, a lot of these bad localizations occur around woke politics. It's become a bit of a trend in anime localization to suddenly make ambiguous characters bi-gender, gender-fluid, or agender, even though this phrasing is almost never present in Japanese. A character who simply cross-dresses may be characterized in English as non-binary, when it would have been just as easy to remain ambiguous or matter-of-fact. The patriarchy thing is also weird, as that term wasn't even remotely present in the original dialogue for Dragon Maid. Sadly, because these awful translations happen to focus around woke social politics, their critics are often just written off as transphobic or misogynist, when that has nothing to do with it. Thus, I'll provide a completely apolitical example for us to go on. In Fate Stay Night, Shiro summons his saber servant Artoria, who first asks him a rather basic question. I ask you, are you my master? For whatever reason, the Aniplex localization of Fate Zero and Unlimited Blade Works changes this line. I ask you, are you worthy of being my master? I don't like this localization because it implies an extra attitude to Artoria that isn't present in her Japanese characterization. The original line mentions nothing about worthiness, which makes sense because it doesn't really matter if someone is worthy or not. The fact that you're summoned at all makes your master your master. Plus, it's just silly. How would you even respond to that? Uh, yes? That said, I don't believe Aniplex was desperately trying to misrepresent Artoria. It seems more like they added the worthiness part to increase syllables to match lip flaps for the dub or something. It seems unlikely that the localizers felt they needed to spice up Artoria's dialogue to make her appeal to Western audiences. Obviously, there isn't a one-to-one -one translation for each and every bit of Japanese. Certain things like jokes or puns rely on specific wordplay in Japanese that has no English equivalent. In those cases, a localizer may find the need to get a bit creative, perhaps injecting a more comparative joke or reference. 
That said, way more often than you might think, there is a perfectly serviceable translation that both flows naturally and conveys the exact same ideas. So long as a localizer is humbly trying to find that ideal translation, then fans won't complain. We talk about faithful translations, and that's rather telling, because faith is a perfect descriptor. We can have faith in the translator that what we're reading or listening to is as close to the original as possible. Was this translation made in good faith, or was the localizer abusing their position in order to preach or inject their own values into someone else's script? The attitude is so extremely important that all the examples we have of poor localization have indeed branded localization itself as a negative term. Self-proclaimed localizers sometimes even try to antagonize fans for being branded as villainous, which ironically just makes them seem more villainous. Thus, we consider good translation just that, translation, and associate anything excessive with the unwanted localization process. That doesn't mean we want translations to be stiff and stilted. We just consider making things flow a necessary part of translating, literally or otherwise. After all, we don't call fan translations fan localizations, as they have little reason to intentionally alter the work. Ultimately, the negative stigma attached to the term localization comes from the very people defending localization practices. Many of these vocal, but hurt localizers are upset that we're calling them out for treating someone else's work as a canvas for their own expression. Rather than being subservient to the original script, localizers are often taking their translation job as an opportunity to demonstrate their own creative prowess. Their own biases and interpretations can drastically alter what characters say and do. Regrettably, the very fact that localizers are getting offended by River City Girl Zero and interpreting the script options as a personal attack just proves they have the dangerous kind of ego we don't want anywhere near our anime. Their inability to understand the context behind Way Forward's decision indicates they lack the nuance to convey someone else's words and feelings without injecting their own. These localizers feel the need to defend their creative autonomy, failing to realize that a faithful translation means foregoing that creativity in favor of what a line should say, and not what you want it to say. That doesn't mean there's only one way to translate any given line, but to use that fact as an excuse to go crazy with your own interpretation is to ironically perpetuate the hate of localization you're trying to avoid. To reiterate, nobody who claims to want a literal translation is asking for some stilted, machine-made sludge. Hating localization doesn't mean we think it's a sin to rearrange or rewrite a sentence so it flows better in English. It's always about the heart of the matter. Can I read your translation and get the exact same information as I would had I known Japanese? Even if that's a technical impossibility, we're talking about being 99% accurate most of the time without having to add or remove information that was never present in the original. Regardless of how companies view it, or a more literal dictionary definition, most fans consider translation to be faithful and localization to be egotistical and unnecessary. The sooner localizers can understand that perspective, the sooner they can recede into the background and get their work done properly, instead of trying to bask in the spotlight of someone else's creativity. Anyway, I hope you guys are intrigued by both River City Girls and River City Girls Zero. They're phenomenal games, and WayForward is a phenomenal developer. Even though Zero wasn't a game they directly made, I'm proud of how they handled this release. Do you support their decision to include two different scripts? Do you wish more publishers would be respectful of our desire for accuracy? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Before we go ahead and roll the credits, I want to give a special shout out to all my $10 supporters. Video Gamer 75, Steven Elak, Samuel Gersten, Otaku Mom, Jens Bauman, Mystic Samurai 1983, Freebrick, RNG or Shuffles 1498, Alexis Yukio Gomez Yamato, Johnny Tsunami, Brickin, Happy, Sakura Chan, Caitlin P, Vladimir Rovna, and SF Giants fan Mike. Thank you all so much. Thanks for watching. 
If you enjoy this channel, help us grow by liking, commenting, sharing the video, subscribing to Otaku Daikun, and most of all, smashing that notification bell so you don't miss out on all of our anime discussion, lore, or Let's Play content. You can support us directly through Patreon, Subscribestar, or our YouTube membership, all of which come with benefits like exclusive vids and early access. As always, celebrate, celebrate your, your fandom! fandom.